day to honor the person. Sometimes it's a person who's done great things that brings honor to themselves. And you can think of many examples like that of people who have done wonderful things and they, they're honored for it. And sometimes it's because they're the first woman, for example, to be elected to a position or maybe the first fielding graduate that becomes president of Harvard University, just to make, just to give one example. Sometimes people are honored because they do great things that address the needs of people like themselves. A person, for example, a woman who's done great things that advances the cause of women or an African-American person who's advanced the cause of blacks in the country. And other people do things that while well, they bring honor to themselves perhaps, and maybe brings honor to people like them, they advance all of humankind. And I'd like us to think today about Marie Fielder in the third category. Certainly a person who did wonderful things and she certainly celebrated for those wonderful things like the Marie Fielder Center we have here at Fielding or the Marie Fielder Fellows Program that we have here at Fielding. But she also advanced the needs and, and the and causes that were important for African-Americans. You, you hear some of those stories today by Jenny Johnson Riley. Things like the busing program in Berkeley, California, or consultation with people like Whitney Young of the National Urban League. You'll hear about that. But she also advanced the cause, the causes and needs of all of us. Women, African Americans, people of color, everybody. And so if we think about this. We celebrate Marie Fielder during Women's History Month, who, made, who did make great contributions and brought honor to herself and to women. But she also brought a sense of humanity for men, for white people, for people around the world. And that's the way I like us to think about Marie Fielder today. The busing program, the one example we often think about in Berkeley, the two-way busing program, it wasn't just to advance the opportunity for African-Americans living in Berkeley, California, to have an opportunity to go to a school that was integrated. It gave white children a chance to be in a classroom with black children. Everybody wins. Men win. When women are recognized and not marginalized and apart, men win. It's not just a step back and turn the program over to Jenny and, and others. You all for being here today. Uh, that we've established in her honor and about the Marie Field of Fellows that we recognize as individuals who want to advance the work in the spirit of Marie Fielder. And many of them are on this call today. So Jenny, turn the program to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, um, for those words and for helping us frame our time together today. Um, and thank you everyone for joining um, for this event, celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Marie Fielder. Dr. Fielder was a remarkable woman. Um, and for the past two years, it's been my honor to research and write documenting her life and career. The monograph, I'm happy to say, is finally nearing completion. And I'm gonna start off today's event by talking a little bit about some of the fascinating things I've learned about her during my research. And then we're gonna shift um, to hear from five of the Fielding, fellow, Fielding Fellows. Dr. Taylor told us a little bit about that program and the Fielding Fellows, um, we do research that is in line with the legacy and vision of Dr. Fielder. And so we're gonna be hearing from five of them today about their um, scholarship and activist projects advancing her legacy as well. Um, and, and then if you'll notice in the chat, Elena has said that if you'd like to post questions for any of the panelists, feel free to do so at any time. And then we are going to um, answer those at the very end. 
So we'll save all the questions, but feel free to po post them at any time. And once everyone's had a chance to present, um, we'll take some of those questions. Okay. So the original intention of the monograph was simply to document the life of Dr. Fielder. But as I've been writing, I've come to think of the monograph as making two key contributions. First, I think that Fielding needs to recognize the role that Dr. Fielder played in the founding of our institution. The current history of Fielding places Halleck Hoffman, Renata Tesh, and Frederick Hudson at the center of the story of Fielding's founding. And while I certainly don't want to undervalue their contribution, contributions, my research suggests that Dr. Fielder played a larger role in Fielding's history than what has been previously acknowledged. And we have to remember that history is not a zero sum game. So even though we're honoring another person and highlighting their role it doesn't detract from any of the contributions that anyone else has made. So in addition to Fielder's name being used as part of our university's name, she helped draft Fielding's articles of incorporation, which were signed on her birthday, March 11th. Second, it's been a fascinating time to work on this monograph because there are so many parallels between Marie Fielder's life and the past few years. And I truly believe that by understanding and documenting her life, we will find many insights that will help guide our way forward. As I spoke with those who knew Marie Fielder, it became clear that her manner of working was an integral part of her success. And so I'll be talking about her achievements and their manner in which she achieved those, or accomplished those achievements today. So Fielder was born on the eve of the last global pandemic, the so-called Spanish flu, uh, which was first identified in Kansas in 1918. The Reformation, uh, she also bore witness to the reformation of the Ku Klux Klan. And unlike the Klan of the Reconstruction Era South, this new iteration drew members from across the United States. According to historian Roy, Rory McVeigh, the Klan of the 1920s expanded its white supremacist agenda to include nativism, racism, religious bigotry, coercive moralism, and economic conservatism. And Dr. Fielder witnessed the world's slide towards authoritarianism in the years leading up to World War II. So as I've sat with her life and work over the past two years, there's been a lot of moments of deja vu as I saw the parallels between her early life and our struggles in the past few years. Given those parallels, one of Dr. Fielder's most important contributions was the remarkable range of her racial equity work. So during the 1970s, she was involved with the Black Panther Party. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, she worked as a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant for school districts and corporations, such as Merrill Lynch and Intuit. She was also hired to assist the Berkeley, Los Angeles, and New York police departments improve race relations, and she assisted NASA's Office of Equal Opportunity Programs in the development of its affirmative action plan. The expansiveness of her work demonstrates how important it is to engage everyone in conversations about racial justice. The story of Fielder's life begins with the story of her ancestors. In 1999, Fielder was profiled by the magazine Working Woman as part of an article on women who worked past the age of retirement. Fielder's profile began with a recollection of her maternal grandfather, a formerly enslaved man who taught himself to read upside down while holding the Bible for the man who enslaved him. Fielder repeated this story often, and it was included in the opening paragraph of the obituary, obituary run by San Francisco Gate after her death in 2002. As Fielder told Working Woman, I come from a family of troublemakers. It's in the DNA. The troublemaking grandfather she referenced was Taylor Red, who was born into slavery in Virginia. When the family that enslaved him discovered that he had learned to read, he was sold to a plantation in Louisiana. And as Fielder's daughter, Nicholas Smith, who's with us today on her call, told me enslaved people who were sent to Louisiana went to the rice fields. And they generally survived no more than three years after their arrival due, due to the inhumane conditions that resulted from the cruelty of their enslavers and the harsh conditions of the rice field where disease was rampant. However, Red was purchased from a slave broker en route to Louisiana by a family who was traveling to Texas. And in Texas, he developed the skill as an artist who carved caskets. 
Red was permitted to keep the money that he earned from carving coffins. And when he was emancipated at the end of the Civil War, he had saved enough money to purchase 300 acres of land near San Antonio. He donated a portion of that land to establish a church, a cemetery, and a school. And in 1871, he married Sally Scott, who was also a formerly enslaved person. Fielder's mother, Ellie Red, was born to Taylor and Sally on December 17th, 1895. She was the 11th of 13 children and the youngest girl in the family. Perhaps because of Red's reading ability, intellectual pursuits were highly valued by the family. Although Sally could not read nor count past 20, all of the children were offered the opportunity to pursue a formal education. The older girls went to Mary Allen Seminary, a school for African-American girls and later taught at the school founded by their father. Ellie was taught by her older sisters, Ida and Virginia, Virginia when she attended the school. And she went on to graduate from Sam Houston College, a co-educational uh, school for African-Americans in Austin, Texas. But despite the educational um, and economic success of the family, they lived in a place and a time in history where racial caste dictated the limits of their upward mobility. The tension between financial success and racial caste is illustrated by her grandmother's experience working as a maid for a white family, which was one of the few opportunities for paid employment um, for African-American women in the early 20th century. The head of the, the male head of the white family began giving Ellie instructions regarding her job at a time when domestic matters were the exclusive purview of women. And Ellie approached the family head of, uh, fam female head of the family and reportedly told her that Ellie's family owned more land than she did. And if she could not prevent her husband from giving her orders, she'd quit. The employer apologized immediately and promised to remedy the situation. I share that story because as Nicola shared with me, stories such as these exemplified the cultural current into which her mother was born. She said, mother was an inheritor of a tradition in which black people were able to act outside of the existing parameters of the system, but within limits. Ellie married Roy Fielder in 1916, and their only child, Marie, was born on March 11th. The Fielders recognized that hopes for greater success required an environment um, that was freer from the economic and racial serfdom that pervaded Texas in the early 20th century. And when Marie was five years old, they relocated to Los Angeles. Fielder was an extremely intelligent child. She scored so highly on Terman's IQ test that the state of California actually sent a worker to her home to ensure that her family environment was suitable for a child of her intellectual gifts. Her high IQ score is noteworthy given that she later critiqued the socioeconomic bias inherent in IQ testing. During her adolescence, Fielder contracted tuberculosis and the primary public health intervention for tuberculosis at the time was isolation in a public sanitarium. Fielder's best friend at the time also contracted tuberculosis and was confined to a sanatorium. Fielder feared that she would die if she went there and she ran from public health authorities. Her best friend did indeed die from the disease. And again, according to uh, Dr. Fielder's daughter, Nicola, this too was a defining behavior for mother because from an early age, she came up with her own way of doing things. So Dr. Fielder's education included college and an undergraduate degree at the University of Southern California, where she graduated in 1942. She earned her master's degree from University of Southern California in 1947. And then she went on to the University of Chicago where she earned her PhD in 1959. Throughout her education, she would give talks at various women's clubs um, and the women who asked her to speak um, became sort of mentors for her and helped her connect with people as she went throughout her career. And um, the other piece I wanted to add here, I'm just piecing through my notes and realizing I'm not sure I had as, quite as much time as I thought, um, that Fielder recalled uh, she faced many challenges as an African-American. And she recalled when she went uh, to the University of Chicago that I, she, she said, I used to say I was the first black woman seen in shoes but she supported, uh, benefited from the support of many mentors. Um, the, and the social and professional networks Fielder created throughout her life played a crucial role in her ability to advocate for policies promoting racial and gender equity within schools, businesses, and the civil rights movement. Um, and she identified her participation in the study of IQ testing at the University of Chicago as one of the pivotal moments of her life. 
um, after her doctoral studies, um, she gave a talk in Pasadena criticizing the cultural bias inherent in IQ testing. And she argued that IQ tests place too much emphasis on vocabulary and reading ability at the expense of what she termed common cultural knowledge. She completed her doctoral research in 1952 and returned to her former teaching position at Jefferson High School in Los Angeles. Yet she struggled to finish writing her dissertation. As someone who's recently completed my dissertation, I really could relate to that. So, uh, Smith noted that her mother had a genius level IQ and could effortlessly maintain an incredible number of initiatives at the same time. But she also had some deficiencies in her personal skill set. Chief among those was her deficiencies in writing. So we don't have a lot of information. We don't have a lot of articles and research that Dr. Fielder published, and she would say that her mentees were her manuscripts. So she really valued the action principles. Her work tended to be action oriented, and she, um, the majority of her writing consisted of proposals and reports, especially those in school district consulting. She did graduate, as I mentioned, from the University of Chicago in 1959. And so Dr. Fielder, we talked about the IQ testing, and I wanted to give a glimpse today of her early life and education and some of the formative pieces that really shaped the way that she interacted um, in her life going forward. And before I wrap up, I want to share a few of her additional um, contributions are, as I understand it, our Marie Fielder Center website is going to be revamped in the near future. And there's a biographical sketch of Dr. Fielder that's going to appear on that as well as some photographs. And we've even have a few recordings of her speaking that we're gonna to try to make available via the website as well. So Dr. Fielder um, wanted to leave Los Angeles after she finished her PhD. And so she moved um, to, San to the Bay Area and got a job at San Francisco State. So she advised students and administrators during the San Francisco State strike of 1968 and 1969. And you might recall that that was the student strike that led to the creation of the first black studies department in the US. One thing I also found really fascinating about Dr. Fielder, and I think this speaks to the work she did to promote community healing, is that in the aftermath of the German, Birmingham church bombings and the King assassination, she promoted, she held sometimes all night intergroup dialogues to promote community healing and prevent further violence. And then or, uh, Dr. Taylor in his opening remarks mentioned her school integration work. Fielder designed and implemented a two-way busing system to integrate the Berkeley school districts in 1968. And she went on to consult with school districts throughout the nation to support their work in increasing racial equity. And I think I saw Dr. Beverly Paley come on um, as we were joining. And uh, she was one of the people that I interviewed for this monograph. And I learned a great deal from her about Dr. Fielder's work in promoting racial equity, especially in the Elk Grove School District. Um, I moved you guys around. So the legacy here. So I'm currently drafting the final two sections of the monograph. Chapter five is going to focus on Fielding's work at Fielding, Fielder's work at Fielding. And the monograph is going to conclude with an epilogue that addresses the Marie Fielder Center's uh, continuing obligations to the pursuit of racial equity. So one of the conversations as a group of fellows that we've been having with Dr. Taylor over the past few years is what is the center's obligation to the promotion of racial equity, especially in light of the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement in the summer of 2020. And so as I've been conducting interviews, one of the things that I asked all the participants was how would Dr. Fielder um, view this current political moment? What would she think the challenges are? What were the opportunities? And so that will be some of the final um, remarks that I have in my monograph. That is what I have to share about the monograph and Dr. Fielder today. I hope that that was of interest to folks. And if you've heard me speak on this before, I hope you learned some new information, especially about her childhood and formative years. Um, and I will, again, if you have questions for me, you're welcome to post those in the chat. Happy to answer those after we hear from the remaining fellows. And I'm gonna turn it now over to Susan Eddington, who is going to talk about her research in um, Black representation in primetime media. Susan? Thank you so much, Jenny. I, it, it's always incredible to, to hear about Marie Fielder and the outstanding work she's done, that she's done. And, and I learned so much. Every time you present information about the progress 
uh, that you're making on this monograph. And, and it's very inspirational, especially to think about the fact that she did these things uh, in the early 20th century, early 20th century, working on the mid 20th century, and uh, particularly looking at how that compares to where we are now. I am Dr. Susan Eddington. I am a media psychologist. I think I might have been in the first cohort of the Marie Fielder Center, thanks to Dr. Orlando Taylor. Uh, and it has been uh, an incredible opportunity. I, I not only appreciate the support for my own research, but I've also had the opportunity to le learn about the incredible work of the various men and women who are also uh, Fielder Fellows. So since we have a very short time to speak today, and I, my research goes on for quite some time, and I can talk way too long, uh, I'll just tell you a bit about the work that I, I've done here. Uh, the study was about media representations. As I mentioned, I am a media psychologist, and I think we're way too far ahead with the slides. So if we can go back to maybe the first one. Okay, let's, let's go to the second one. Um, next. Okay, thank you. So, no, back. Back one. Okay, so oh, can I do the, the slides or... Um, the order you okay, there. Okay, hold it right there, and, and I'll say next slide, and then we'll know when to move forward. Okay, so so my work was my work was motivated by uh, a, a personal history in politics. I, I have a very long history in in um, uh, politics, national politics, late local, late state and local politics, uh, and issues management and um, lobbying and, and just uh, social activism, social and political activism. One of the things that I experienced probably in the 90s, I was uh, an elected uh, official within the Republican Party and I attended a convention and it was amazing to me because I was an observer at this point that David Duke, who was a former Grand Wizard um, of the Ku Klux Klan, was also a delegate seated directly behind me. And Louisiana had a sitting governor who was not a proclaimed racist, but this party, this, uh, this, this party had decided that they would support a candidate for governor of the state whose policies and positions were very reflected attitudes of racism, intolerance, bigotry. And uh, I'm watching every time the man would make a statement, David Duke would stand up and give him a standing ovation. And I saw that as a, a long, long struggle and that there would be a rise in racial intolerance. It's always been an issue, but it, it was something that was not a part of our past and unfortunately would be a part of our future. So when it came time for me to look at the various issues I could study, I felt I needed to focus on this issue of racism, intolerance, bigotry, and its consequences in our country. So I, as a, my Marie Fielder project, I, as a media psychologist and a communication strategist, my work looks at the role that media has in influencing attitudes and behavior. And since media is the primary cultural influence of, of our time, uh, it's, it's more evident to see the role that media has. I selected for this particular study, which um, is from my dissertation, uh, media representations of black women in prime time. And that's because most people watch programming that's aired during prime time. Okay, so we have seen a rise now, this, the, the, the statement here, us from a report from the Kerner Commission in 1967. 
This is race prejudice has shaped our history decisively and it now threatens to affect our future. So here we are, uh, these many years later, and we are still confronted with the very same issues. It would seem that nothing has changed. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Susan, about five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when we talk about why representation matters, and I focused on Black women, um, uh, media is Black women are, are reflected in television programming. Their, their representations are also ste often stereotypical. And the stereotypical representations tend to marginalize the real life experience of Black women. Media representations have, me, have effects. It, the representations don't only impact Black women, uh, it affects any audience that you're looking at, how they are, especially when people don't have an opportunity to interact with these individuals uh, on a routine basis, their opinions about individuals are based upon what they see in media. So in this instance, we looked at the uh, story, we can go to the next slide because I don't, I, you know, we can go on for a, a while. Uh, this particular project was a content analysis of, of three programs uh, aired during primetime that had Black women as the leading character. When these shows came out, it was the first time that a Black woman had been the leading character on a television show in primetime in 35 years. So it, it was remarkable and a, an opportune time to study how would Black people be perceived? No, how would Black women be perceived? So I analyzed episodes of these three shows, How to Get Away with Murder, Scandal, and Empire. Next slide, please. So I used the theoretical framework of social identity, which is uh, which looks at, let, let me say that most of my work is in, in focuses on intergroup relations and, and how people find themselves and belonging to social groups or categories uh, and how other people perceive them based upon the group or category that they, they belong to or that they are ascribed to. Social identity theory, uh, also looks at, at how people um, define themselves based upon these various categories. And then transportation theory, and these are three of the theories that I used, looks at how people who consume media content, particularly frequent viewers, uh, tend to believe what they see in television and carry what they see over into real life. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So I looked at these variables because these are the, the, the typical variables that define how particularly women, and in this instance, Black women are viewed when it comes to media. And I won't say just television because it carries over into other forms of media. Uh, there are the stereotypes. It's based on age, skin tone, which is particularly relevant for Black women. Uh, their attire, their attractiveness, their sexualization. Are they sexually, do they demonstrate sexually provocative behavior, their body type and uh, degrees of aggression? Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, about two minutes. Okay, thank you. So the findings, and, and obviously it's much too much to describe here, but what I found were, was, uh, uh, let, let me just say, that usually when you, women are defined by what is, what is, what is termed the, the uh, dominant feminism. And the dominant fem feminism suggests that the ide ideal in dominant feminism is to be a white female, thin, uh, considered um, physically attractive and uh, whole middle class values, uh, the keeper of sexuality, and you say yes or say no, and it is the woman's responsibility to, to um, generally shut down inappropriate sexual activity. And that is defining characteristic for women in America. So what I found in 
this study after, and this was a, a specific study, it was not generalizable, but the three characters were bold and courageous women who were complex characters. All three characters were professional women and they were business owners in high profile, high status positions, exemplifying a degree of agency that is seldom seen in female leading characters, period. Not just black women, but in women, in female characters. The episodes included in the sample, in the episodes included, two of the characters though, however, portrayed the Jezebel stereotype, which means they use sex as a tool to achieve their goals or their desires. So this took us right back to the, the historical tropes, the negative portrayals of Black women. Uh, such representations devalue Black women in a gendered and racially biased power structure. But one of the things that I think is very significant is that it suggests that it could suggest that even though Black women are not portrayed as the mammy character or they are no longer presented as a welfare queen, there are certain traits that they would have no matter what they achieve or what their status. And this, of course, be, if, if Black women are judged, Black women in the real world are judged based upon these representations that are seen on television in prime time on shows that were highly regarded, highly successful, watched around the world, when someone sees you and you're going in for a job interview or you are, are presenting yourself as a candidate for elective office or, or whatever you might want to do, that's in the back of the mind of a person. That could be in the back of the mind of a person when they're looking at you and they're judging you based upon their assumptions based on these media representations. Can we go to the next slide, please? So part of what I said I would do as um, my project for the Marie Fielder Center is to not just conduct the research, but to present it to audiences, um, various audiences really everywhere. Because uh, could I say almost to anyone who would listen. So I have had an opportunity to present this work and I do a lot of work in the area of media representations and their influence on uh, attitudes, particularly when it comes to racism and intolerance. And, and so when we talk about intolerance, it covers a lot of areas. But um, this research uh, has, I presented it uh, before uh, an audience um, that was uh, a in a program coordinated by the Congressional Caucus on Multicultural Media. Uh, I pre presented it to international audiences. I presented it to um, audiences coordinated by a, a, a church ministry. Um, you know, I, I, I presented it in, in different aspects of it and, and its significance to a number of audiences. I've done follow-on re um, research. Uh, I recently did a study, um, a new attitude, music promoting self-love and, and acceptance, uh, which includes many of the issues that Black women face. If we start talking about um, uh, body acceptance, self-love, um, um, size, uh, and the various issues that have to do with how women are sexualized. Uh, there are a number of issues that, that are, are evident as we look at this. There, there's so, so much more research to, to, to explore uh, when you look at the difference between where we are with a woman being sexualized and an agency. And part of that uncertain has everything to do with changing values. And that's where we are now. You know, For one person, they might determine that a woman is being sexualized or sexually objectified. And then there are other instances where you see women who are, who are engaged in self-sexual objectification and who believe that they, it is absolutely their right uh, to be sexually active with whomever they choose and as many partners as they choose. There are, there are a lot of, of other um, stories to be explored and issues to be explored in this, in, in this, in, in this area. Uh, some of the other, you can go to the next slide now. Some of the other work that I've done uh, when looking at issues pertaining to race include the impact of media representations and their influence on criminal justice. Um, the influence, the cultural influence of comedy and how comedy is, has an influence on, on um, uh, uh, 
uh, people's perceptions of others. And comedy is, is particularly interesting because when you look at, at how people are portrayed in comedy, it's usually in jest, but you have to wonder, are you laughing with the audience, the, the, the person, or are you laughing at them? And, and people- and I'm so sorry to interrupt. Do you wanna offer a few uh, closing thoughts for us? Yes, these are my closing thoughts, oh, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so, so what I'm saying now is all of this has relevance to our, our current experience, um, we don't get beyond it. Media representations make a big difference as we've watched the trial of, of Judge Katanji um, Brown Jackson. We see how she is portrayed and, and the assumptions that are made about her. Uh, if you read all of the, the, the story and responses that people have, uh, but it's an issue that hasn't gone away and it affects people um, no matter what their social identity might be. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about this or, or any of the other research that I'm currently conducting along these lines. I am extending this study and doing a study of media, uh, meaning making for Black women in high profile and high status positions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan, for sharing all of that with us. Um, we are going to turn it over now to Greg Williams who is gonna talk a little bit about his recent work with upper ballot and down ballot candidate voter guides, um, voting rights, racial justice, and disability rights. Greg? Thank you, Jenny. The way that disinformation of widespread voter fraud leads to voter suppression, especially among historically disenfranchised communities, this is my critical research area of interest. So the voter guides have been something that I raised as a potential project back in 2020, with the nonprofit, nonpartisan Count of Sins Education Committee Fund uh, that I chaired. So we empower people whom the US power structure historically has suppressed. Those groups include Black, Latinx, Asian, Native American, women, uh, LGBTQIA+, those who live with disabilities, students, seniors, immigrants, uh, individuals distressed by poverty, and those affected by incarcerations. So although our organization is Indiana-based, Count Us In has gained a national following of individuals engaging our virtual training on voter rights, resources, and education. Eventually, I formed a task force for the voter guides, and I got the idea for that from following the nonprofit, nonpartisan Vote Smart's political courage test. So, Vote Smart measures candidates' willingness to answer voters' questions through the political courage test, and that test keeps voters informed by providing a record of, of candidates' stances on a range of issues. I had several conversations with their research and executive directors to learn best practices for, for um, designing the guides and then distributing them. So our voter guides will help our member groups to gain or, or to, to make uh, more informed voting decisions. We divided them up into three main sections, voting rights, racial justice, and disability rights. Each section contains a mix of closed and open-ended survey questions with additional areas for the candidates to explain their legislative priorities. So we're distributing the guides to elected officials running for re-election or first time election and, and their opposing candidates. We developed one guide for upper ballot uh, can, uh, candidates and another for the down ballot candidates. Uh, Jenny, if you could put the first, first slide up, please. Yes, and you wanted upper ballot first, right, Greg? Yes, please. So, uh, All right, so we're looking at the, um, in the first section for voting, for, vo uh, for uh, voting rights, uh, see the first question that we ask is, do you support the following proposed legislation? Uh, with A, B, C, D and, uh, as possible choices uh, for yes or no, and the first one is for the People Act, um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, absentee ballot applications, election administration, uh, would you support paper, the paper ballot as a voter option? Do you support elected election officials removing names from the voter rolls for any of the following? This is called purging. Failure to vote, thought to be dead, moved, or ineligible to vote for some other reason. Uh, then we can have a, a question for an expanded response for that. anything on that section for voting rights they can uh, elaborate on. So moving down to uh, the section two on racial justice, we ask, do you agree with the current allocation for the police budget? 
If you answer no, please explain. Do you support an advisory commission to address aggressions against racial, ethnic, and religious minority communities? Whether intentional or not, do you recognize that partisan redistricting, also called gerrymandering, impacts historically marginalized communities disproportionately? Expand, res, expanded response for section two. And so now moving down to section three on disability rights, do you support legislation to remove voting barriers that hinder people with disabilities? What suggestions would you make on how to make voting more accessible for people with disabilities? How often do you engage directly with your district, uh, district's disability community? With whom from your district's disability community do you engage? Do you want them to commit to giving a, uh, names of people so, just so that they don't get away with just saying, yeah, I do engage. Uh, if you answered number 13, what are you doing with this input that you receive from this community? Very important follow-up question there. Do you have a plan to engage with the disability community if elected or re-elected? If you answered yes to that one, please provide details. And again, expand the response for uh, section three. And so down the, below that, the, we have a final area for uh, legislative priorities, in which we ask the, the uh, candidates to give a more detailed uh, uh, answer to how, uh, how, what they plan to do with their, with their priorities. What, what are their priorities? And then a follow-up to that for um, explaining how they plan to finance it. All right, so now, uh, Jenny, if you can pull up the, the next one on the down ballot. All right, so here, these are a little bit different. Well, mo most of the questions on this survey are the same, but there are a few distinctions. Uh, so looking at the first section for voting rights, the first question, do you support do you support the following proposed alternatives to casting ballots in person on election day to help drive voter turnout for demographic groups that historically have experienced barriers to traditional voting? Sending vote by mail applications, instituting 24 hour early voting, introducing drive through voting. You can see some of these questions are geared more for local type elected officials. Uh, number three, would you support opening satellite election offices located within communities where citizens could register to vote or update the registrations? apply for mail-in ballots and vote all in one visit? If you answered no, please explain. All right, so moving down to the next section on racial justice, uh, you can see there the uh, first two questions are distinct for this survey. Would you support providing information in languages other than English to ensure that voting information reaches our diverse communities? If you answer no, please explain. So the remaining part of that, uh, of, of that uh, uh, survey are uh, pretty much, well, they are the, the same questions as the, the, the first survey. So the committee members, we brainstorm potential, to come up with these uh, questions, we brainstorm potential questions, but I was focusing on the outset from on finding questions for consideration that had already been used effectively by others for a voter guide so that we didn't have to uh, pilot test them. We, sh uh, we shared them with our coalition groups to get their insights, um, you know, making sure that we're getting to the questions that they want to see answered, adding questions, and then editing along the way. Our committee uh, reconvened to organize the questions appropriately and gaining consensus. And we did that again another uh, time with the coalition groups, again, just to be sure that we're all on the same page with everything. So now our communications committee is responsible for distributing the surveys. And as anyone who's ever distributed surveys knows, it can be a real challenge to get higher, higher returns on those. So again, we plan to borrow from Vote Smart's aggressive strategy of encouraging the candidates uh, using phone numbers, email, and postal mail addresses, their social media accounts. Uh, we've created a database with all that information in it. And as we begin to receive the completed surveys, we'll begin analyzing the closed-ended responses. Of course, it'll require more labor intensity to analyze the open-ended ones. So, I asked our committee, uh, committee's organizer to convert the final survey iterations into Google Forms to enable quantitative analysis and data visualizations. And as a certified Atlas TI software trainer, I offered to coordinate the qualitative analysis. As we get deeper into the analysis, we'll begin to gain a better understanding of just how we want to present the data, but we know we want to hold the elected officials' feet to the fire for sure. So first, we'll achieve that by compelling them to, answer, uh, to, to share their positions on the issues that are important to our members and coalition groups. And when the election winners begin voting on issues down the road, we'll be able to go back to the survey responses 
and show who's been true to the word and whose actions belie their stated positions. Not only can we share that with the elected officials to get their comments, but we can share it with media members and also, of course, our, our uh, uh, nonprofit members and coalition groups. So the voter guides will contain helpful information. Also, besides all this other, our guides will contain information very helpful to, uh, to our historically disenfranchised uh, community groups to vote. For example, ID and registration requirements, um, poll locations, mail-in options, and so forth, things, things like that. Thank you. Jenny? Great. Thank you so much, Greg. Our next speaker is Sabrina Epps, and I was told um, just prior to our meeting starting today that Dr. Epps' dissertation was just posted in uh, ProQuest, so congratulations. Um, and Sabrina will be talking today about leading the future, superintendents' perceptions of leadership and future public education systems. Sabrina? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and, and for engaging in um, allowing us to, to engage in these presentations today. Um, Jenny is pulling up my slides. And while she's doing that, you could just um, stay on the title slide for a little bit. And I'll just give a quick uh, background about what, what um, my impetus for doing the research. So this was my dissertation research. Um, I have a, a varied background, but spent about 15 years in, um, in community college and also working in different, um, more informal capacities with public education students. And seeing, um, I was in academic advising, and so seeing the, the gaps in where the students were um, when they came to the college, you know, I got really interested in what was going on between higher ed and um, public education. And so I ran for a seat on my local board. Um, but unfortunately, um, soon after, maybe three months after um, I was elected, the legislature changed the state statute and I was um, basically stripping the board of its authority over the school system and concentrating that uh, the authority with the superintendent. And so, as you can imagine, on a four year term, I spent four years actually watching the superintendent lead the um, lead the, the school system um, where my one person vote really didn't matter a whole a whole lot, um, because in addition to that, um, the legislation also added appointees to what was previously um, a fully elected board. And so it remains to be a hybrid board. Um, there's a lot of tension there, but I was really focused on what was going on in the, in the system and to see what was happening, particularly with the schools that I was representing um, in the district that I represented and the utter dismay of parents, teachers, students, um, at not being able to navigate the system and, and the system being a very closed system in terms of communication. Um, and so I was pretty distraught when I started at Fielding because of all of that. And although I was very emotional, um, the, my coursework and the process of getting to the dissertation really did help me um, deal with that and heal from that and turn it into an actual research question. Next slide, please. So instead of um, projecting onto superintendents, you know, what they should, how they should lead or what they should do, I wanted to know how they perceive themselves as agents of equity and change. And then I was thinking, even if, um, because oftentimes in meetings when questions were asked, um, or the, the, the topic on the agenda were discussed, I noticed that even if we um, got rid of all the drama and the politics and everything, and we just did you know, the curriculum and the policies and all of that, would we really be setting our students up to be successful, not only as society is today, but as society will be when, they're, when they become adults, not to mention other students coming in behind them. So I really started to become um, interested in, you know, how do we set students up in an equitable um, environment, 
not only for today, but for their lives in, in the future. And so hence my research question, how do superintendents perceive themselves as agents of equity and future education systems? Next slide, please. So what I did was, um, and you can populate that. It's for, yes, thank you. Uh, so I looked at obviously general systems theory, um, and I also looked at uh, the, the literature on education leadership, as well as the, the literature on superintendents. And um, I'll go into a little bit more about future studies in a little bit, but what I started to see, particularly in the, in the um, education leadership literature, as well as the literature on, superintend on the superintendency, first of all, I was really surprised that um, education leadership focused primarily on school leadership and not so much on systemic and district leadership. And, and then when I looked at the superintendency, I noticed that those, um, that the topics that were discussed was really about the pipeline of becoming a superintendent, um, experiences and retrospectives of superintendents, of, of long-term superintendents who had retired in terms of what they you know, felt that they needed or, or you know, in terms of mentoring and, and that kind of thing, being prepared for the position, um, as well as um, reactions to reforms. And I really felt like that wasn't going to get us where we needed to be, neither in terms of equity nor in terms of preparing for you know, future students, particularly given the, the many demographic changes that my previous fellow fellows have alluded to in their presentations. Um, next slide, please. So that led me to, um, in the midst of my research, that led me to the field of future studies. So the field of future studies has a history in, um, it's a multidisciplinary field that employs qualitative and quantitative methods to understand cultural mindsets, patterns, and trends. Um, you can keep populating that. Uh, and the tools come from uh, multiple disciplines, which conceptualizes and analyzes alternative futures. What um, in the beginning, there was a focus on prediction but really future studies and what's known as critical future studies and foresight really has come to become more about co-creation and inclusion, as well as um, drawing on the human traits of imagination, aspiration, and anticipation. And so it really seeks to empower individuals to employ their own agency and to act as um, in terms of change, social change in community, society, as well as global changes. Next slide, please. So the cultural framework for my, um, the conceptual framework, I'm sorry, of my um, study was born after reading the literature um, on those four areas, especially in future studies and foresight, and is fueled by the moral imperative for cultural change that we have heard from leaders around the world um, all through the, you know, the 20th century, but in particular over the last two years with um, the pandemic and the, and the fallout in schools um, with regard to how um, the pandemic has revealed all of the inequities in school districts around the, the country. And so um, since schools are at the heart of acculturation, I was very interested in how school district leaders and superintendents can be levers for both equity and how they envision public education in the future. Um, next slide, please. So with regard to this, this um, issue of, of thinking about time, it occurred to me that time is colonized along with many other um, uh, social constructs. Um, when we think about the past, it, particularly in the, in the scope of a school district, um, it's very much like what you would think of in terms of, a, of chess. You have your king and your queen, there's a hierarchy there. Um, and, and then of course you have the executive team, principals, teachers, students, and, and then the community. In the present, there's been you know, this, this constant loops of um, constant loops of policies and funding and education reforms. And so, you know, 
everything has been tweaked from curriculum to teacher practice to you know, um, assessments and requiring students and parents and people, when you think about the, the hierarchy of society, those with the least power have to change. Meanwhile, the, the inherent system, which by the way, public education, when it was um, envisioned in the 1800s as uh, common schools, was never meant for the children of the enslaved or indigenous peoples um, or you know Asian Americans when they came and and dealt in to help build um, the infrastructure of the country. It was meant initially for elites, elite men, um, and then further along, you know, uh, girls and women. Um, but it took you know into into the obviously you have the Brown versus Board of Education of 1954, and then of course there was a lot of blowback from that um, from that policy, um, and that from that court decision and the policies that followed. And so this tug of war of education reform and everybody's talking about reform. How do we get out of these um, these loops in terms of which are not really you know moving equity forward. So then when you think about the future, what's the role of superintendents? I, I was thinking about superintendents as the hub where, you know, in between teachers and policies and students and parents and community, superintendents, and this is what I observed even as a board member, were, um, is the convener. You know, at any point, if the superintendent wanted to give a community meeting, all they had to do was call one. Whereas teachers and students and, and um, parents and, and even community members don't necessarily have that cachet. Next slide. So I spoke with um, I spoke with seven superintendents, three male and four females. Um, I wanted to have my study be as broad as possible, even though it was a small sample size. So uh, the it consisted of three males, four females. Um, Five were African American, one was white, one uh, identified as indigenous to North America, um, and the range in age was 45 to 58. The goal, um, obviously, oh, and the, they represented the Northeast, Mid Atlantic, Midwest, Southern, Southwest, and Western Canada. Next slide, please. Um, the also of note is that the um, the total students of the of the seven districts ranged from uh, 1200 students all the way up to 79,000 students. So I conducted a semi structured qualitative uh, semi structured qualitative interviews. I actually did three rounds. This is a, a, a typo, but I actually did three rounds of coding. Um, I did. Um, open coding, and then I did categorical coding, and then I coded for, um, I kind of coded again, just to make sure that um, I was, you know, I was capturing the essence of, of the narratives. Then I did a, a categorical analysis, as well as a metaphor analysis, and then finally, which is a tool of, um, that's used in future studies, a causal layered analysis. Next slide. So in terms of the categorical analysis, um, there were there were seven, uh, yeah, there were six uh, categories that emerged um, the, in terms of th that came from the narratives of the superintendents. Awareness of agency within the role, affirmation um, of their leadership capacity from Everyone from their previous um, uh, their previous supervisors in, in lower positions to um, other peer superintendents to their families, particularly their parents, um, and more particular to that, uh, their mothers uh, talked about you know affirming their leadership capacities, and then of course their uh, in terms of how they led in their school districts. Um, they created district improvements through equity practices. Many of them were participating in national um, equity cohorts for leaders in uh, for education leaders around the country. 
Um, they, they led to ensure equity for marginalized students, many standing up to groups and of, of parents or board members or teachers or anyone else who felt who um, gave them resistance to new policies that they wanted to implement to bring more equity. And which also led to their disrupting their systemic behaviors or systemic practices that were um, inequitable. And then we did a visioning session. And interestingly enough, when given the opportunity to envision their school systems 10 years into the future, so I conducted the study in 2020, I had them envision um, their districts in 2030, they had really limited visions of um, the districts beyond the overcoming the challenges that they were facing today. Next slide. Sabrina, so, if you could offer some closing thoughts in the next minute or two, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. I just want to, I, I, I wanted to go through really quickly the um, causal layered analysis because this was really the crux of it. After having the uh, superintendents envision their, um, their districts, then we went through um, the, the, a deeper level, a deeper dive into um, their thinking. So whereas you would think about the litany and systemic causes being those kinds of um, you know, day-to-day -day issues, and then of course the systemic issues that causes the day-to-day -day fires that they were putting out, but then to go deeper and to ask them about their worldviews and then the myths and metaphors um, from their narratives deep within that gave rise to what they really envisioned, I found that what ended up happening is the bridge to the future is in that, that latter and deeper place in the myth and metaphor. And so if you, it, a place of, of a starting point for creating new futures or co-creating new futures as conveners could very well be in the visions that come from the metaphors of what they envision their um, districts to be like in the future. Next slide. Okay, this is the last two. So basically, this is the, uh, the figure that I came up with that how futures inform the present, because as you move into the future and, and basically kind of transcend the, um, that loop in the present of all of the critical issues, if you can see what you want the, the future district to look like, then you're able to back map, um, backward map the, the steps to take which can then help you to, to change um, the policies and um, the practices so that you will realize the, the equitable district that, that superintendents were seeking in the future. And so just in terms of recommendations, I thought that this was, next slide, I thought that this would help with, um, with um, the, the teaching practices, in terms of becoming a, a superintendent, in terms of those certification programs, I would like to um, work very closely with those programs and also continue to work with superintendents on this. Um, I actually did present to the, um, the at the International Leaders Leadership Association, um, Leadership Association Conference in Geneva, Switzerland. And, um, and also submitted an article based on the research to the Journal of Future Studies. And so it is my hope that um, we can broaden the conversation of our issues by using the future to inform us about how we can um, start to make those changes that we seek today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina. And again, congratulations. We're going to hear next um, from Wendy Mulhauser, who's going to talk about teaching empathy to encourage racial equity and connection to our earth. And Wendy, if you'll just give me a second, I will put up your slides. But sure. go ahead and get started. Oh, I just, may I just say, I feel like I'm basking in the glory of the brilliance that came before me, uh, beginning with Dr. Orlando Taylor and Dr. Um, Johnson Riley, and, oh my gosh, and Dr. Eddington and Dr. Williams, and then the amazing job that Dr. Epps just did with her most recent research. This is fantastic. I'm glad there's a pause. I am just... 
I, I'm wanting to just think through all of it. I'm, I'm so honored to be in the presence of all of you, to work with all of you, and then to learn about Dr. Fielder uh, from the very beginning with the presentation um, from, from Dr. Jenny Johnson Riley. That was just wonderful uh, to, to learn that. I, I hadn't realized that she had that advanced IQ. I knew she probably did, but I didn't understand it was even as, as high as it was. And then for it to be she who exposed racial bias and standardized testing is, is even more <laughs> wonderful, isn't it? And, and such an irony. Thanks so, so much, Wendy. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so I, uh, I'm Dr. Wendy Mulhauser, uh, and I am I am an exec director of uh, Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund, and I do need to share that uh, three of us uh, serve uh, on that nonprofit together from Murray Fielder um, Fellowship. Uh, Dr. Williams is the uh, chair of the College Planning Committee of ours, and then Dr. Eddington is on our board of directors as well. So uh, we can flip through this <laughs> and go to the next slide. And then this is just me thanking you for being with us today. I'm so honored to be a Marie Fielder Fellow. Next slide. Uh, my dissertation was about empathy as it related to racial equality. Uh, and it, my work in my dissertation is just revisiting my, my books, the musical plays, the songs, uh, the lyrics, the kinds of things that I implement to get points across in multimedia modalities as an artist and as a scholar. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I should share there's the picture of it, but I'll go ahead and say it the next time. There was a there was a woman in the previous slide I was going to give you a little bit of a clue about and then I forgot to. Uh, so my dissertation is called Creative Play for Teaching Empathy to Young Children. It's written, but then there's a visual and narrative journey uh, with it with a documentary film. I'm going to read just a little bit of this. Operating from the hypothesis that much of our prejudice and inequality results from a lack of empathy, my dissertation answers the research question, what reflective insights emerge from an autoethnographic study? Whoops, head back to the other one. Sorry. No problem. Let's see where I was. <laughs> um, what reflective insights emerge from an autoethnographic study of creative storytelling and play in online teaching of elementary grade children? This was an autoethnographic examination with a video component of my online teaching and experiences that emphasize playfulness, empathy, diversity, and inclusion in the context of education and for general youth development. Through the use of documentary style presentation, I offer excerpts then from my teaching. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Collaboration with interns uh, surrounding social justice, you all know I believe in strongly. The interns that I've worked with now serve on our board. Next slide, please. So Diaris and Anthony were interns with me for many years who now serve on the board. Diaris has an album out called Defining Ourself. His unity infused positive affirming messages had resonated so deeply with me that I wanted to make sure to infuse them within the documentary. Anthony on the lower left did a lot of the editing for the documentary film and his music is within it. He sings a lot of the lyrics that I've written um, and he was in the musical play uh, for one of the books. Go ahead and go to the next slide. That this is a visual of the documentary film. We are really humbled that utilizing visual to get messages of of leveling a playing field with, with play uh, for learning, but also through play for learning, offering an opportunity to learn empathy, which we believe is aligned with an understanding of racial equality, has 2,042 views. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, scholar artist impact. Hmm. Innovative creative modalities. Uh, through doctoral classes like theories of change, I recognized and residing slightly outside the systems I seek to impact. This offers a unique capacity to implement with these creative innovative modalities. Uh, it seems like it could be less threatening to the status quo. As a scholar artist, I can impact in a broader way perhaps. Uh, and I'm hopeful about that. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So the second book came out in 2019, uh, went out and did some uh, Barnes and Noble signings, uh, Empathy Airlines, but then everything was shut down. Empathy Airlines has gotten two awards, uh, New York City Big Book Award and a Mom's Choice Award. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I went too far. Mm -hmm, no problem. I had shared this previously, uh, having a black female pilot to inspire the biracial little girl named Hope or Nicole. It's a really important um, representation. Uh, similarly, it's very important that there happens to be a black male executive on the plane uh, and, and to have the representation that Dr. Edding Eddington was speaking of. Next slide. This is quite interesting. Uh, on the right, you see the cover for Tristy Sparkles, the book that I had written with the um, with her black teacher and this beautifully diverse classroom. I wanted to make sure the point was out about uh, the disparity in education for uh, for minority educators. But get this: when I took a look at this, this there was a little bit of a pause with this because of COVID nineteen. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, get the other one book going out as quick. So I had to pause this one and look at what, and you maybe notice it too. I was pretty concerned that the white girl in this image on the right could imply that the white child or the white person was more important than her diverse classroom members, including her teacher, when they're underneath by the artist. And so I decided to change to make sure that her teacher and she share the, the middle of the cover and that the influences that she um, has in her life are on on the top of her. Uh, next slide. Uh, we put a, we put an image of um, uh, out um, from that that we'll be adapting to. We had put Sparkle Sparkle, a beautiful uh, song that Anthony helps me with, with his gorgeous voice, uh, out around the time that uh, the second book came out. But again, we'll be adapting that cover. Next slide. A musical play in 2018, um, Black Man as the Hero was my heart. Next slide. So this was the play that was done in 2018, 2019 um, of Jelly Beans, The Cheetah and Hope and the songs from the book and then a couple of other songs that I wrote. Go ahead and go to the next slide. That's my um, colleague Cornelius, who we were teachers together. I asked him to be in the play. Here are a couple of, um, of um, of pieces of music, one single called One Child Cries that's in Empathy Airlines that we did use um, within the uh, play ahead of time. And then Anthony um, is the one who is responsible for producing these and getting these out. And there's an album on the left. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This was really quite exciting. After my graduation in 2021, I um, I launched uh, a nonprofit called Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund, and I shared that uh, we have a pretty strong field and contingent. Two people from um, our fellowship are on uh, the board. Uh, Laniel Henderson is our president, and there are some others. Brent, Dr. Bryn Schroeder is on as well with us. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We did get our 501c3 uh, in December. Um, I'm going to take the time to read this quickly. Our mission is this purposeful education outreach worldwide through technology online in person and through children's television and other venues the specific purpose of our 501c3 nonprofit is to provide education training and opportunity to learn about social and ecological justice we model and teach equity and anti-racist shared humanity and sustainability practices these actions of love empathy peace, service, and creative play are at the heart of building and repairing communities, including our world community, affected and impacted by a lack of understanding of human diversity. Specifically, the nonprofit will provide education and training through online workshops, events, written composition, creative original works of art, theater, music, television, and ultimately, the creation of an institution of higher learning as avenues of spreading the mission and vision of Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund. Next slide. Inclusion, books, plays, music, and all media. Emotional well being for every child is at the core of what we're doing through empathy, with storytelling and play, 
advancing education empowerment and access is paramount to our work. Next slide. And Wendy, if you could offer us some concluding thoughts as well, that would be great. Sure. Okay. So go ahead and go to another slide. Okay. So go through again. Okay. Teacher awards. Um, go ahead and go to that one. Okay. So teacher awards um, in equity in teaching and empathy in teaching is um, is an initiative that we are that we are doing. Next slide. And then I'll go ahead and go through that. Next slide. Nomination form has you are personally responsible for becoming more ethical than the society you grew up in is on our form. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We're very excited about our podcast called Educating Empathy. Next slide. Um, the, the first two um, editions are uh, Toby Tomlinson Baker. We are talking about ability versus disability. We are both doctoral uh, graduates talking about how we made it through. Dr. Henderson is the next, uh, the next guest. Uh, he talks about teaching at two HBCUs and fielding um, for the purpose of having a view overall of how the system is run, not just from the perspective of one college. Next slide, please. Uh, an upcoming uh, interviews on the podcast are of Kay Carter, a family of firsts in Duluth, Minnesota. Her family was the first one to live in a certain neighborhood, and it was meth which, with such hatred that the N-word was sprayed with kill um, on the side of their house more than once. Uh, she is just so courageous in sharing the story. Her mother is also a first black educator in that community. Uh, Dr. Anton Troyer is preserving the Ojibwe language. I am interviewing him May 3rd. Uh, next slide, we're just about done. This is our crowning uh, jewel at this point. Uh, we are launching a children's television show called Sissy Mary Sue World Schoolhouse with a variety of uh, teachers from all backgrounds, all ethnicities. Uh, Global Jamie will be teaching a non-binary character. We'll be teaching all about the natural world. Next slide. I um, appreciate the time and I'm sorry that uh, we as educators get sort of um, long winded, but thank you for your time. Uh, and I'm just thrilled to have been with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. It was wonderful. Um, okay, and our final panelist today is gonna be Robin uh, Trepto, who's gonna talk about founding of the indigenous Infant Mental Health Association. I don't know how much time we're going to have, if any, for questions. Um, and I apologize for that. I haven't seen any in the chat so far. But what I'm going to do is ask all the presenters to put an email address in the chat. And then that way, if anyone who's listening today has questions that they want to follow up with you about, they can do that offline. Thank all right, you. Robin, I am going to yeah, pull you, up Janet. your can slides you... here. OK, great. Can everyone hear me OK? I just want to make sure before I get started. So I'll just give a little bit of background while the slides are coming up. So my Marie Fielder project kind of uh, wafted and waned a bit in different areas, but um, its culmination in this founding of the Indigenous Infant Mental Health Association, I think really speaks to the heart of my project. Originally, I was looking at um, biases, very young children. So my specialty is infants and young children. and. I'm just going to be sharing um, some background of, of the sort of the reality of what is happening for us currently in the Montana Association of Infant Mental Health. So I am the founding president with two indigenous folks who are on our board. And we began this at a time when our state, um, you can actually probably go to the next slide, Jenny, was looking at doing infant mental health more broadly. And um, so we, um, we're working at this, had brought it to numerous meetings uh, to make sure the indige indigenous voice was included. And I, so I think the reality was that we did not really comprehend the degree of um, vitriol in the, in the bias against what we were doing. So we incorporated in um, November of 2020. And when we posted to the group that we had incorporated, anticipating some degree of solidarity, some degree of appreciation, I mean, diversity and equity is, is all over the infant mental health climate. Um, Jenny, does it work to go forward with the slide or am I? 
to do that. I just want to. I make had sure. some temporary difficulties, but I think I'm doing okay oh, now. No, it's okay. It's but, actually not a big deal. I just want to kind of know um, because I could do it without any advancing of the slides too. So we were met with just a lot of in-your-face bias about our having had the audacity to found a Montana Association of Infant Mental Health that specifically named um, Indigenous folks as board members with a certain percentage of Indigenous folks as board members, and to do it without permission of all of the white folks that were already working on infant mental health. And they called in like the national sort of groups who then sort of took us, to, I mean, took us the task and so forth. And I tell that story in part because we've now since been incorporated in 2021. We received, I think, our incorporation the same month as, as Wendy. Um, when we, we, um, we are still recovering from that degree of, of backlash from from those individuals. For one of my indigenous colleagues, it brought up for her images of having been raised in a small community in Montana where the signs on the community doors said, no dogs, no Indians, right? And so I guess we were naive, but now we're moving forward and we're really in a place now um, where, well, the slides that are coming up, if they come up, will show you the land of Montana. And you will see that it is covered with tribal, tribal entities. And this was the land in 1860, if I'm recalling um, the date in that general area. So this was, this was indigenous land, this was indig indigenous. And then you can see the very small reservations that have been put into that place since then. Um, do, I, do I need to go back or forward? I don't even see any slides going forward. So I actually don't know where you are. Oh my goodness. I don't know why you're just, you're not seeing them at all. I apologize for no, that. I don't, but I don't know if anyone else is. I only see the very first slide and then, and I don't know if it's something. Yeah. Do other people see or no? Hmm. Um, no, we cannot see the slides advancing. You can see the slides advancing. No, we cannot. Oh, you cannot. Okay. Um, uh, I stopped. I can go ahead. Do you want to share or I can try again? I think I oh, will. Um, sure. sure, I can try to share. Sure, let me just get my PowerPoint up and um, get to the first slide. Um, still trying to get to the first slide. Hmm. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay, here I am to the first slide, and then I'll go ahead and yeah, slide, slide there. Where's go back to Zoom? So sorry. Um, but what I really want to to leave everyone with is is that um, place of where when there's a fresh trauma that happens in the midst of this of this work, we really cannot anticipate how that will play out. And really we as a board have determined, can everyone see, but it's probably not in, it's a little messy. Um, if everyone can tolerate, I guess that will be okay. Um, so everyone can see the big slide with the small ones on the left, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, and I, let me see, maybe I can go ahead and do slideshow. Yeah, I can, so I'll do that. Oh no, actually that's not going to work. Um, yes, does that work? Mm -hmm. Can you see? I see the first one, yes. You see the first one, okay, great. Um, and then I just, so it, here is the map that I was referring to. This is just a map of Montana today. Um, and just we use a case example to sort of bring this home to the folks in Montana. It, didn't actually resonate very much with folks, um, but how this cultural sense of babies in West Africa was a piece of how we introduced that. So this gives you a sense of how these are infant mental health folks who are not able to see the importance of the richness of a cultural heritage. 
So kind of embedded in our whole focus is to resurrect some of this cultural sense of baby. So again, my, my indigenous um, board colleague, she recalled that when her brother had died when he was very young, so when she was conceived, her mother was sent to a very isolated place and they implemented very much indigenous practices around her mother in that state of, of conception and so forth. And that is very powerful and moving for her. And those are some of the pieces of ind indigenous heritage that have been robbed of all of the tribes in Montana. So there's, a, there's you know, just trying to recover the sense that you would have a cradle board, right? Or she tells the story going through the airport with a cradle board and people don't have a sense of what that is. So here is all of the um, all of the tribes in Montana, and you can see in red here all of the individual reservations that have been created from this. Now I will just share when we first wrote our bylaws and they need revision based on some um, expert consultation we got we named the specific tribes in Montana and made sure they had representation. But based on some feedback that we got, that actually was not our best um, description because there are other indigenous folks in Montana who may not um, have a voice based on that. Um, so we will make, make those revisions in order to make sure that it's um, truly open to all the tribal members. Um, so, this just shows you the individual tribes. So that's the Flathead Nation. Um, and again, all of them together. This is the Blackfeet Reservation. I'll just try to go through this a little quickly because I don't want to. This is uh, the Chippewa Little Shell. They've recently been recognized and are opening a clinic that we hope to interface with. Um, Robin, I'm so sorry to cut you a little short. Yep. Could you maybe share some key takeaways with us? Yes, sure. In fact, I don't know how to get to the end of my slides, but maybe we can just leave it at that. So I think the key takeaways are that if you're doing this equity work, it's important to lean in. So we on the board are just accepting, like we've tried for some grants that they haven't necessarily moved ahead. But the indigenous way is to accept and embrace what comes rather than becoming um, unsettled or anxious or trying to sort of grasp at what you thought was going to happen when you begin an effort like this. And I think that's been um, my key lesson. And I would say that that's um, our key takeaway just a little bit there, ghost in the nursery is just a sense of infant mental health where you're bringing in those, that sense of the past and using it to inform uh, the present and what is going forward. And our, so just a, another little takeaway is that we are looking to do a video in hopes that this can be an avenue that we can use. Um, we're hoping to use a high school, one of the uh, native tribes high schools, we're doing some video work and we're really just letting that project un unfold as it happens. And we're hoping um, we talk some with um, um, Dr. Eddington about giving us some consultation on that. And so we're really excited about that possibility. And so that's my closing thought and I will exit. Thank you and so much, Robin. And thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you to all our panelists and thank you to everyone who came today to listen to these wonderful presentations by our fielding fellow. Orlando, no, we're going to be opening a new round of applications for Fielder Center Fellows. And I wonder if you want to make a brief announcement about that. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, we are opening a new uh, round of invitations for acceptance of fellows in the Marie, Marie Fielder Fellows Program. I think it's very important that you all understand that these individuals are doing work either related to their, their dissertation work or their work at fielding or beyond that work. They're really carrying forth their, their, their sense of inquiry, their, their commitment to social justice and engagement of the entire population of our society. 
And we encourage them, by the way, to publish their work, to go to professional meetings where they interact with others, or they make presentations at national meetings, because we don't want their work to be seen inside of a bubble. We want them to be engaged with the intellectual and academic communities so that their work begins to inform the interests of others, the scholarship of others, and of course, carries the fielding banner into various academic uh, arenas. So their work is extremely important. I hope you all uh, really could see that today, that uh, this is uh, not just an exercise for the participants, it's something they care passionately about, either to educate the public or to advocate for ideas or uh, for causes, and of course, to advance research. Those are the three pillars of the Marie Field of Fellows program. It's about advocacy, education, and research. And I think you can hear it all today. Thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon. It means a lot to every one of us and particularly to the presenters and to all of the other fellows. And I wish they would identify themselves. I see several others on, I think there are others here. No, I guess they're all, you, you heard from them. They're here. There are currently 15 fellows. We have a call for uh, applications for a new cohort starting in the summer of this year. And so for those of you who are interested in becoming a Fielder Fellow, we'd be very pleased for you to, to uh, submit your application. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Um, I, I noticed um, Nicola's question, is there gonna be a recording of this presentation? And yes, we're just gonna quickly confer after the call. And then I believe that it'll be available on Fielding social media and YouTube channel. Is that correct, Elena? That is correct. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry we didn't have time for questions, but again, thank you to everyone and enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening, depending on where you're located this afternoon. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you.